Hi, I'm Neil Harding. I'm Mark Ashworth. Okay, and today we're going to talk about your goals, your goals in property investing and your property journey and what you want to actually really achieve from property investing, which is really important. And probably I think Mark and I agree, it's probably the number one question that you should always be asking yourself before you do any investing at all is what do you actually want to achieve? Absolutely. There's no point in just going off and buying random properties and having no idea about where you want to go with it. And what the reason is, you know, what are you going to use the money for or what are you doing? Are you using it for wealth building or is it an income? Uh, and hopefully today, uh, just in this short video, we're going to be able to give you a few ideas about stuff to think about when you're uh, considering starting a portfolio. Yeah. So I think the first question to ask yourself and and hopefully have an opportunity to discuss with um, friends, family, loved ones, or even you know, ideally someone who knows about property is informed, doesn't necessarily have to be a mentor, but someone that's informed about property, who's educated and, and ideally has got to where you want to get to, have a good conversation with them and talk about what your achievement, sorry, what your goals and, and objectives are, where you want to get to in property. It's really important to be clear on that right at the very start. And, and I think for me, property investing and your objectives really fall into probably three main umbrella categories. They're, they're really around capital growth, which is one, income generation and retirement planning. Um, it's possible that it could be a combination of those things and there are probably subsections of those things, but I think they're the three main things, capital growth, income and retirement planning. Sure. Um, I think you can also probably have a little bit of both. So my intention originally when I first started was just, in fact, the very first property I had, I had no real interest in making a profit every single month. It was just a case of let's keep the property, we'll keep it for capital growth. Um, and then as I decided to get more and more into property, I decided to build um, assets and properties that would actually give me income. Um, so therefore, I started to build up uh, units which would give me, essentially would replace my income. First of all, they were supplementary and then they became um, to a point where I was able to re essentially replace my trading income um, for investment income. Um, so, um, and that was probably something that I had considered when I was thinking about wh where I wanted my properties to take me. Um, so it's really important to think about that. But I think we've highlighted a few, um, let's say, positions that people are in or that could that you could be in that you'd be considering. And maybe um, that would reflect on whether you decide that you wanted more of a capital growth portfolio or an income generating portfolio. Yeah, that's right. So, so one example could be that you're a professional person who loves their career and, and can't ever imagine leaving your, your job, your career, you, you work for a fantastic company or in a fantastic profession, and that really is what you want to do for the foreseeable future, maybe for tens of years to come. Um, and I don't know, may, maybe you're a, you're a doctor who loves to save people's lives, or you're a teacher that loves to see children learn in a school, who knows. Um, but I think that that is um, something that you know, Mark, you and I have met people in that situation before. Um, sure. They're not looking at property for, for something to create a new job for themselves. They want something probably that's as passive as possible and a way to make their money work harder for them. Yeah, so that might be more sort of hands off. It may mean that they've got, because they've got such a great professional career that they love, they may want to, they might have some funds that they want to put a bit more money into their property so they can afford to invest a little bit more into so they may go for something which is in a lower yielding higher capital growth area so let's say for example you've got a low yielding capital growth area typically you're not going to be able to get the kind of mortgages that you would get on higher yielding properties so therefore you might be thinking about putting more like 50 percent of the value of the property into the property deal in the first place but obviously over the long term that's going to provide you a much or a very high capital growth level um, so towns and cities that are fairly common for this uh, are Cambridge, Oxford, probably Brighton, clearly London, although London is definitely has its own microclimate and goes up and down. Um, but yeah, so you want a sort of hands-off approach where there's lots of chimney pots, i.e. there's lots of people who would rent the property um, and also in affluent areas where rents, you know, you can charge higher rents, even though that the yield may be, may be somewhat lower. Obviously, a lot of overseas investors typically like, I mean, Cambridge is a great example, and we know it well because we're local to it. 
Um, but you know, invest, it, it attracts a lot of overseas investors where people just want to put their money into a safe place. Yeah, yeah. And, and that same person may also be interested in capital growth with a combination maybe of retirement planning. So they may already have a great pension from their career as it is anyway, but maybe they're also looking as a way to create a, an even stronger income when it comes to their retirement age. Yeah. Um, so what else have we got? We've got company or business owner who wants to invest their profits. Someone like yourself, like me, Mark. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, so basically I had uh, excess profits from my trading company that I wanted to do something with. Um, obviously, the goal originally was to replace the income, but I had profits that I was able to invest into my property company. Now, the really cool thing about that is that if you own your own company and it's a limited company, you can actually, if, you're, if, you have direct, if the directors of that limited company are the same as the directors for the limited company that you have in your uh, pro- as your property company, you can actually do what's called an intercompany loan, which basically means you can send the profits from one company to the other company to invest in uh, in in, um, uh, in property without actually having to extract it from your company account first, which basically means that you only pay the tax at the corporation tax level and you're not paying any additional uh, income tax to take the money out of the company before investing it yourself. So it's actually a very efficient, tax efficient way of investing your your profits into um, into property, uh, which is something that I've done and 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 I'm still doing. Um, so yeah, it's I'm, a great I'm strategy. Pleased, I'm pleased you've raised the point around tax there instead of, <laughs> instead of me, the accountant. It makes it gives me. Oh, a, I love tax too. It's just a day I'm not, off. It's not nice. quite as versed in tax as you are, but <laughs> that's, that's it doesn't good. stop me from enjoying talking about it. <laughs> Um, so we've also got an employee who wants to escape the rat race. So someone with a job and maybe, unfortunately, they, they really hate their job. They just don't want to do it anymore. Um, and they're thinking of a way to create a, set, a different life for themselves, a different lifestyle. Maybe you want to be more in control of your, your day, your week, um, be in control of your time and your life again. Um, so someone that's looking to to get out of that, I think is more interested really in income. You know, they're, they're yeah. looking for not just income supplement, uh, but also a, an income replacement really, because they need to be able to live off that. Um, and that's um, something that I managed to achieve um, last year. So um, through investing in property, um, I um, left my corporate role as a chartered accountant in 2022, um, having invested in property for many years, um, and uh, build a portfolio that provided uh, a level of income that I was able to live off, which is a fortunate position. I'm very, very fortunate to have been able to achieve that. But um, that, that's um, one of the great things about that for me is that it's, it's given me time. Um, so it's, it's given me um, my day to be in control of. And um, you know, my, I suppose I feel more in control of my future now than I, than I was before, um, which is great. So yeah, and the other way to do this probably uh, maybe a bit quicker, let's say, um, you know, is to go for those sort of, um, as we talk about capital growth and we, and we talk about income generating. Um, so one of the strategies that I deployed um, in order to replace the income was to go down uh, the route of, um, of uh, the HMO strategy, which is essentially to produce properties which are much higher yielding. So you can take a property that could be a single letter, which might be lower yielding, which means you'd need more of those units in order to, cre- to create the similar income to so arguably needing more deposits. So if, you're, if your cash pot is a little bit lower, then perhaps investing in higher yielding stuff um, is a good way to transition. I say transition because it's probably easier to buy HMOs once you've bought a single let. Um, some lenders aren't particularly happy with uh, lending to people if they've not actually had any property investing experience at all. But actually, you can take your gross yields up to sort of 12, some, it's somewhere in the region of between 12 and 15 percent um, if they're really good quality properties, uh, which will obviously give you a much better income. Um, and depending on where those properties are, they may not give you such good cap- capital growth. But I, mean, I think you're always going to get growth, aren't you, over a period of time in terms of inflationary growth and stuff like that. But it just might not necessarily go up as much if you've got it in an area which is, you know, essentially lower incomes and, um, you know, I mean, a lot of places like that tend to be in the northern parts of the country, but there are still some areas in the south which are lower yielding, um, sorry, higher yielding, but lower capital growth areas. Mm. Um, so yeah, um, th- those kind of strategies would work well for people that are trying to get out of their out of their day job. Having said that, I would always encourage people to stay in their day jobs for as long as possible. 
as a buffer, credit worthiness, all these other things. So, you know, don't jump straight into it. Give it some considered thought and have what I would call a transitionary period before going you know, straight into it. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. Don't leave your, your corporate well-paid job too soon. Yeah. Um, you want to cut your teeth on buy to let, investment, property, whatever your strategy is, but on property investing, and you want to do it a number of times and make sure that you're well versed in, in that and you, that you can make it work before you uh, plunge into the deep end of property full time. Yeah. Um, what about, Mark, the, the sort of person who wants to build a bit of a part time side hustle? So that maybe they have a, a corporate role or career or they're an employee of a company or they do have their own business, um, but they want to just do something on the side, make a bit of extra money. What about that sort of person? Yeah, I think again, I mean, that, that sort of person to me, if they're wanting to make the money, um, I would say again, probably income is where you'd probably want to look. Um, I don't necessarily think that either way it would be a, it would be a deal breaker. It depends on the amount of time that you want to put into it. Um, I just think, you know, it, it, like with most things, it depends on the personality. But I just think what we're trying to do is to give you an idea that you need to really sit down and think about what you want out of it, what you mm. want out of the property, what's what's important to you. So, you know, if you're if you've got some time to spend and you could, you know, you could easily manage a, a small portfolio just in a few hours a week if you wanted to manage it on your own. Um, and uh, depending on how much money you've got to invest is a massive factor. So that's what you need to sit down and decide. And if it's if it's a lower amount, then you might end up going for a lo- higher yielding, low low capital growth properties initially. Um, but ultimately, if you you know, there's also the argument using leverage about whether or not you you could buy one or two or three properties based on whether you put um, use mortgages or not. Our strategy is always to use mortgages. Um, and we'll probably cover that in a future video yep. uh, with regard to why we do that. Um, but yeah, it all, it all depends. But there are um, there is that sort of just the importance of sitting down and working it out, seeing what's best for you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I think, so for me, I built most of my portfolio whilst working quite an intense full-time role in London. Um, and what was important for me was that what I built, I wanted it to be as passive as possible. Mm. So I didn't have the time, frankly, to to create even a part-time side hustle. You know, it wasn't something mm. that I could spend, um, you know, ten hours a week doing. Um, so I needed a power team around me. I need. We'll do a separate video on this as well. But you know, that concept of power team. But I needed a reliable mortgage broker. I needed estate agents to source the deals for me. I needed letting agents to manage my properties. I needed it to be as passive as it possibly could be. Um, which I think is something that you'd also want to be thinking about if that's you know if that's your situation that you're in. Um, another scenario that that I come across through networking events when people are talking to me, and I think you probably have as well, Mark, is you you, you speak to people sometimes who's who have just inherited a property. Um, maybe it's um, your grandma who's passed away, um, and you've just inherited a bungalow. Um, and sometimes these properties are in good condition, sometimes they're not in very good condition. I've spoken to people that in both of those situations. Um, what, what do you, you know, what thoughts or advice have you got for people in that situation? So one of the downsides with inheriting a property is that you actually haven't had the choice to purchase it yourself. Yeah. So you haven't had the option of checking out whether it's in the right place, checking the fundamentals of the local area, um, checking to see whether it's easily rentable. Um, all these kind of things. So you end up with a property that has, um, let's say, a bit of baggage. Yep. <laughs> and you, you need to start, try and work out whether that is actually the best strategy for the strategy that you want to do. So if it works in the capital growth area, then fine. Um, if it works better, if, you, if you're looking for more income generating um, and it's not really bringing any much income based on its value, then perhaps it's time to perhaps put that on the market and do something more, you know, a bit more creative with the money. Um, and go down the route that you want to go down it with because I think you had the experience yeah. with someone inheriting a property that actually wasn't quite right for them. Yeah, I did. Um, so um, the the property was a sort of sheltered accommodation type property, uh, one of these managed uh, block of flats for the elderly, um, a sort of over 55s or over 60s complex. And the property, in all other respects, was great. Um, but with those sorts of complexes, the, the service charges on them and the fees um, really eats into your profit mm. every month. And, and it sometimes doesn't take 
too long before you realize you've had a month where it's cost you a bit of money mm. um, because of the service charge. And then the next month it costs you a bit of money as well. Plus if you're self-managing and you're not used to it, it, it can, sometimes it's not very long before you've fallen out of love with being a landlord for the first time and, and you decide that landlording and property investment is not a good idea and I'm not doing it anymore. Um, and that's not necessarily the case. It's just simply that you've inherited the wrong property for buy to let and you've tried to make it work for a property that's not right. Um, and I think you're right, Mark, that sometimes it's actually to better to sell that property mm. than use the funds in a different yeah. way, um, whether that's property or, or, or not. But if it is property, a property that's actually going to suit your strategy. So going back to the reasons right at the beginning about writing down what your goals are, talking with your partner, sitting down, working out what you want the property to do for you and see whether that aligns. And I think something like that in a situation where you've inherited something and it isn't right, then obviously, you know, you can just take a rain check and go, okay, you know what, perhaps we need to move this on and, and choose something else. That being said, you might have inherited the, a perfect property. I have a property my mum lives in, uh, which is absolutely ideal for buy to let. Uh, so, you know, um, if, if, um, if they're become, well, I say if, when the day comes, because <laughs> let's say we all know there's two things in life that are sure, aren't there? What are they? You. Yeah, I know one of them. <laughs> yeah. Taxes is definitely one of them. Yeah, well, death is the other. So, um, so yeah, you know, so her, her property would be ideal from a buy to let perspective. Mm. But I know a lot of people, a lot of older people who live in houses that just simply would not be a good buy to let yeah. investment. Yeah. Um, so yeah, look at that too. Yeah. Well, I think that covers this uh, for this video, doesn't yes, it? Yes, I think so. Enough. Yeah. Uh, so thanks again for watching. Uh, I hope it's been insightful uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next one.